A very good evening. Uh, welcome to the NSC Center for Behavioral Sciences webinar series. As you all may know, uh, the NSC CBS has been hosting a range of webinars since it was inaugurated in December 2019 at the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. The first of its kind in a management institution in India, the NSC CBS aims to build a cross-disciplinary platform for conducting and disseminating research grounded in neuroscientific and behavioral knowledge across diverse fields of management, including but not limited to finance, economics, marketing, organizational behavior, and human resource management. Over to you, Akshay Ma'am. Akshay Ma'am is uh, Associate Professor in Marketing at the Indian Institute of Management, and she will be hosting the webinar for today along with Rama Bijapurkar Ma'am. Welcome. Thank you so much, Varna, for putting this uh, together. And it is my absolute uh, pleasure to moderate uh, this session. Uh, so I'll brief, uh, Rama needs no introduction, but like uh, all webinars, we must start with a brief introduction. Uh, 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 so Rama, it's uh, it's one of the most distinguished alumni from uh, IMA. She has spent a uh, lot of time at the institute as well as uh, in the industry, uh, and she brings in a lot of experience from the industry. To uh, as she has spent her time in the industry as a business advisor, independent director on various boards, academic institutions. And uh, she she provides a people view of the business strategy and public policy uh, to the boards and also to the public through her books, which include uh, one of the most popular books. We are like that only. Totally. I remember reading this when I was doing my MBA several uh, decades ago. <laughs> uh, but I, so it is my I'm very thrilled that today I get a chance to actually talk about your latest book with you. Uh, Lilliput land. So Rama, thank you so much for uh, joining us here at IME. And uh, I'll just uh, get started by asking you uh, why, uh, why, what prompted you to write this book? And why do you, why have you called it Lilliput land? Usually the thing associated with India is mega, big, huge. It's all big. <laughs> and you're saying Lilliput land. So I, it's a bit surprising. So what's the logic behind it? Yeah, good question. Hi, Akshaya. Thank you. I am a Center for Behavioral Sciences. Uh, it's really, I mean, this is, this is not just my alma mater. It's also my spiritual home. Uh, it's also both my husband and I alumni from here. And I have uh, taught I hope there are no students here because uh, uh, they will remember that I am known perhaps a little more for tough love than for kindness, but it's always uh, wonderful to be back here. So uh, yes, this is the third of my series. The first one uh, was called We Are Like That Only, Understanding the Logic of Consumer India. And that was written because at that time, everybody, including uh, all the big consultants, uh, and there is a lot of consultant bashing in my book uh, in a good way. Uh, but uh, a lot of them actually believed that as India got richer, if you put per capita income on one axis and consumption of everything on the other axis, then hey presto, we can predict India. And I used to say that no, we're different. And I used to work for a uh, big global consulting firm. And I remember uh, one of the partners there said to me, he was Dutch Brit. He said, why do you people believe you're different? Do you wear your noses on your ears? He said, there's water flow uphill in India. And I said, well, maybe it does. And I thought this book has to be written to say that, look, we are not like someplace else some time ago, nor are we going to be like someplace else sometime in the future and that this ugly duckling of a market is never going to become a familiar beautiful swan it'll become a valuable ugly duckling and that's where we'll go and I'm really gratified that over time now and in this new book also I have quoted many of the same consultants uh, talking about how you need specific strategies for India and how India is different but we're like that only uh, the forward to that book was written by CK Pralad and he had a line that I wish I could have written, but then I'm not CK Pralad. And he said, listen to the logic of India from within. And that's why it was called We Are Like That Only. Subsequently, uh, I had another one that tracked it called The Never Before World. Um, and uh, then over time again, 
as you say, there's been a lot of chest thumping about the fifth largest economy tracking to be the third, and um, you know everything is mega. And and as I always say, a small percentage of a large number is large. So even three, four, five percent of India will make us the first, second, third largest thing in the world for any bloody thing, good things and bad things. Uh, so I thought that maybe we should actually look a little more at what is this consumption story, uh, because multinationals don't get it. A lot of Indian large Indian businesses have stopped serving the mass markets of India, which I write about. So then I I, I thought that uh, our little secret that we often don't talk about in India is that while we're the third, fourth, fifth, first, second on most counts. When it comes to per capita income, for example, we are well below 120. And so we are a large economy made up of lots and lots and lots of small uh, income people that together adds up to a lot. And that is our essential DNA, it's our structure, it's our soul. And um, that it means that as, as a market, whether it's a consumer market, a B2B market, a B2C market, a B2 anything market, we are a market that is made up of lots of small buyers and lots of small suppliers. And the small buyers are served by the small suppliers and the whole ecosystem is yoked with wonderfully small digital transactions of which we are the largest number again in the world. And so I thought that uh, I would like to talk about the fact that is often not talked about, which is that we are a agglomeration of small that makes up big. And that's what makes us different. Our business economics are therefore more complicated. Uh, so, for example, if we are doing uh, single serve, single use diapers and not a whole box, 95% of our cigarette consumption is sticks. Uh, we have more sachet sales than bottle sales. And, and so I've often asked the question that what makes us believe, uh, what makes anybody believe that you're not a real consumer unless you consume a lot per capita, very frequently in big bottles. And therefore, we're all the time waiting for the consumer to evolve. But consumers have not, you know, the trains already left the station because we are Lilliput land. Uh, Lilliput land is about small adding up to big. It's from the story of Gulliver's Travels, uh, which I don't know if anybody who's not my age has read. But uh, it's, a, it's an all-time classic which talks about a giant called Gulliver who went to the land of the small people and together the small people actually managed to uh, pin him down and chain him up. And I've often thought that uh, small India and the small Kirana and the small shops together have have brought many a big multinational to its knees. And so that's that's really uh, really what uh, what really put land uh, actually is. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about this aspect of, of the market and to say that, uh, and to say three things broadly. Uh, one, to say, let's embrace our demographics. You know, let's not pretend to be something we aren't. Let's not, you know, yes, we, we, we buy, we are the second largest or the largest market for Lamborghinis in the world, but there are only 1,100 Lamborghinis that sell in a year, 100 are bought here. And while we may be important for Lamborghini, Lamborghini doesn't define us. And so we really are, uh, uh, that, that is the essential nature of our market. So we're modestly educated, modest income, uh, long tail of scatter. We have really hard demographics. So my first section of the book is called structure. And I'm saying this is the structure of our demand. Let's embrace it. Uh, the second section of my book is called behavior, which is consumer behavior. And I feel that a lot of us love the behavior section whenever as analysts we talk about the Indian market because structure is not so nice. Behavior is cool. Never before have there been so many people who are dying to consume. I always say we've added a new god to our pantheon and that god is consumption. Right? Everybody is dying to consume. And the only thing that's stopping them is, uh, is income levels. I think that... Uh, uh, I grew up in the socialist era, and uh, today I can tell you that uh, even my God is consumption in many ways, uh, consumption with guilt. Uh, my daughter's God is consumption without guilt, as I suspect is yours and your son's. But, uh, uh, but the behavior piece is a done piece, and we'll talk about it. I mean, yes, it's digital. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's a virtual world. Yes, we have high digital quotients. Yes, we have high aspiration. But everything about the behavior piece is really nice. 
And then my last section is supply, where I'm really saying the consumer in India is way ahead of the supplier. The supply side has really, really, in some senses, let us down in terms of how much more it could have done. Um, so the large businesses do not, the big domestic businesses do not really want the small consumers. The multinationals do not want the small consumers. The multinationals are looking for extension markets of what they already made elsewhere. And so they don't really want to make for India and make for this large number of small people. And so the market has been, except for a handful of companies, the Hindustan Unilever, the GEOs and so on, uh, a lot of which I talk in my book. If you look at the total turnovers of companies who've been here for a long time, it's really quite small compared to what a $5 trillion aspiring and almost their economy should actually have. It should have a lot more. And uh, the, because of this supply, uh, this, this whole mass market being walked away from by the large suppliers, um, I'm actually showing how it is the small suppliers who've been serving this mass market. And we will see that you go into any street market, you go into any, uh, yeah, we've had the Chinese in, in flux after that. And so a lot of the action, if you look at food, for example, a lot of the action is on the streets in the small shops with the street vendors. And that's where we actually are. And that is essentially, uh, and these guys have got smarter over time. In fact, I say that they are, more agile, more innovative, more customer intimate um, than you will find a lot of large companies. I mean, think about all the stuff we buy, the small guys actually serve us better. So finally, I'm saying that Moksha is here because so far managing price, performance, we have monster consumers. Uh, we can pick that theme up later. We have monster consumers who want high performance at a low price and we have companies who want margins. They're not even willing to do margin into volume equal to profit. They want margins and margin gates. And so this price performance profit has been a circle that's been hard to square. It's just not working. And we've tried in many ways, uh, you know, we've tried through wonderful work that uh, uh, small companies have tried to do and so on and so forth. But at last, I think what is unlocking us now is the new economy, which is why I'm really so excited about it. And the last section of my book talks about it. It essentially says that the new economy inspired companies and business models are just right for our DNA. They're aggregating small suppliers. They're aggregating small consumers and therefore building mass in a sense in both ways. They are crashing costs by digitalizing every process. And that has crashed costs and got us to a cost position where you can actually do much lower price for much higher performance. They are enabling sharing, efficient sharing digitally. And all these are new ways of doing old things that we've always done for a long time. And uh, this new economy model is able to now give us, uh, and they've also enabled sharing. They have uh, made it seamless and they've crashed costs. And so if you take this whole combination of aggregating demand, aggregating supply, crashing costs and digitalizing processes to crash costs further and enable sharing, you suddenly have a model that can actually serve Lilliput land. And that's why I'm betting really big. And I talk about many of the new startups that are actually doing that. And that is the whole sort of structure, behavior, supply is the thesis of my book. So I'm saying you have to look at all three together to get a holistic view of the most important part of our economy, which is consumption. Uh, so that's a long answer to your short question. I'm a marketing type. I have to plug my book. And so I have, and I'm happy to answer, to, to, to move to whatever you want to talk about. So yeah. I have a question, Rama. And I yes. was just connecting this to what I teach in my microeconomics class. And this will be sort of the old, you know, uh, sort of how the old company comes into this market space. And I was teaching price discrimination and we were talking about second degree price discrimination, which in the West usually means quantity discounts. You buy in bulk, you get a discount. Uh, if you, then, you know, whenever I pull up examples in my, of my class and I do big basket and so let's see if there's a quantity discount for Maggie, for shampoo, and what we see is, you know, your story playing out, at least in pricing, where the small sachet and the single serve is cheaper per unit or per uh, milliliter 
than the uh, large bulk quantity, which is being bought by the premium segment. So at least in terms of pricing, the traditional companies have figured out that they need to offer discount in the small uh, single serve packages rather than the, uh, the bulk uh, sale packages, which is the flip of what happens, which is the exact opposite of what happens in the West. Yeah, you're absolutely right, uh, Pritav. We we call uh, it, it is a sashaizing of everything. In fact, even if you're buying uh, bandwidth uh, data, you can buy a little dollar for a sachet of data. It's called a prepaid uh, little booster, and you can use it for the period of time when you have the wedding and everybody's like going bananas, or when you have an election going on, and then it disperses and it goes away. So now the sharing economy has enabled us to sashayize a car. So now why do I have to struggle with the two-wheeler and take this large family out to a wedding to show status? You know, I can now hire a little bit of a car and a little bit of any car I want, right? I can hire clothes. I can, earlier, you know, tractors were really a pain in the neck to be able to hire because they were never there at the right time at the right place when everybody needed them. But now the sashayization of tractor time is so perfect because the digital economy enables, the digital capability enables us to seamlessly move things across. So yeah, so sashayization, you're absolutely right, is, is, the, is, is the price magic. And very often, sachets are actually better on margins than big, 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 uh, uh, big products. Because if you can sweat the same asset that many times, you get much greater margins. So yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, uh, I I was just reading today about insurance also going that way. So you you pay as you drive rather than you get a bulk insurance for a year. So it will change as per this thing. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but uh, let me start from uh, something uh, what you said in the beginning. So you, there is this whole, whole Lilliput land. They are being served right now. They are being served by small retailers. But what you're suggesting is it's not efficient. Or are you suggesting uh, that the big companies are not doing justice to how they are? They What can be done? Um, yes, I am saying that small is serving Lilliput land. And I have asked the question in the book because it has bothered me a lot. And, you know, I'm not an economist, by the way, uh, Preeta, with uh, due apologies and respect mm -hmm. and all my friends are economists and so they, they're always my daughter's an economist and they're always telling me how to think about things and uh, so I uh, uh, I so I have asked the question what's wrong with small I mean you know why are my economist friends getting so upset about small and why are they so obsessed with scale I mean I also know that there's there's a lot of uh, very nice Vienna School of Writing about the small, but why, 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 what's wrong with small? Why is small a dirty word? And I think essentially, if you are a small company, then you don't get access to the resources that you need, to the R&D that you need. I mean, the trouble with a lot of our small companies is that you are not getting, uh, you're not getting everything that you could use to fully exploit your potential and serve your consumer better. So you are not able to do R&D, you're not able to uh, forge linkages, you're not able to withstand the shock. I mean, come Corona, it all goes, you know, come and slow down in the economy, it all goes. And so clearly, while small is beautiful, small does need to be bolstered and strengthened. And uh, there is, of course, something to be said for supplier power and buyer power and, you know, scale. But not scale for scale's sake. I mean, when people say to me that, oh, if you have scale, you can compete better. I'm looking around and saying a lot of my big companies on whose boards I sit are actually so busy saying this is my share of the organized market. And, you know, half the market everywhere is actually not so, is, is, is not disorganized. In fact, I've stopped calling it organized, unorganized. That was of my youth. Now we call it the small and the big. So I think the small sector is actually gaining in share, is gaining in quality. I mean, I'll give you a simple thing. If you look at, uh, and sometimes we are leapfrogging the small. The small. So for example, if you look at uh, food and if you look at packaged food, I mean, before packaged food really got its price performance point right and made 
husband acceptable chapatis and so on and so forth you have somebody's grandmother somewhere who's making it for you but now she can pack it better because there's more packaging you find these guys are sealing better you put it into we fast and it's coming to you better and nice and hot and so you know at the end of the day we will bypass many eaters because uh because that's what's available to us so i think the message for large companies is a the future is going to be uh fears of competition from small companies you can sit and say this is my island but there's another big island there the message also is that you know when lot lot large companies say oh when the consumer is ready when incomes go up then i will come but you know small uh, con- uh, consumers like time and tide mass markets don't wait for you i mean you know they'll find their own path and they'll move on as we've actually seen so if you've grown up with uh, uh with absolutely fine small brands that have served you very well you don't really move to big because it's big so i think the message to big companies is that you have to either start targeting these people or you have to figure that they will bypass you altogether and that you should actually be taking a leaf out of these people's books right okay thanks rama so you did mention about uh, r&d Uh, so we, i'm going to use that as a segue to talk about innovation also which you mentioned in the book jugard frugal innovation so one of the things uh, i mean it's mosquito season in ahmedabad right now <laughs> and uh, my i i totally totally believe in the bat <laughs> that's yes. the only thing <laughs> that works right yes uh, yes and that is i feel like a good example of this uh, chinese companies taking over the streets uh, and yes. now i see Martin has a bat, and uh, Hit has a bat, right? Yeah. It's some it's percolating from down under. So, is this what you mean by R and D, like that, or frugal innovation, Jugard? What do you have in mind, or what is that um, you're talking about? Yeah. Or, so or this is just way off. <laughs> way no, no. I think the so so let's take the guy who made the bat. Okay. Firstly, the point is that the bat came from some small guy. I guess it didn't come from Absolutely. the big guy, right? So so efficient. It, so the dharma of business and as marketing types should underline it further that it is to add value to the consumer and extract value from the consumer. So you're here to solve consumers' problems. Consumers' jobs are to have problems. Your job is to solve them. Your job is not to drag consumers. king screaming upgrade downgrade upgrade downgrade i mean you know i i just find i know it's popular but i just find well, what am i going to do with this right at the end of the day if i want that mosquito dead and i have uh, uh <laughs> and if my sensibilities allow the bat okay let's be politically correct here i think that it came from the small guys now after that the big guys will do the copycat and say i will do the bat and at that point the small guy can't really fight back and actually because he created the bat he may have five versions of the bat you know and maybe the kind of bat that you don't have to go around chasing and you can have it at the dining table maybe it's a bat that temporarily stuns these guys and doesn't kill them i don't know maybe it's a bat that you can hang on your windows so that they don't come in through your windows maybe it's a bat that you can make window meshes out of so that it's completely done right 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 now they don't have the the necessarily perhaps the money and the bandwidth uh, or the knowledge and the skills at that point in time to think what next what next but if you had the money and you were in there you would know it mm-hmm. the trouble is that we don't see the big companies either doing it <laughs> right so they're doing a copycat of a bat or for example i look at how people wash dishes and i'm just so surprised that in every household that dish cleaning liquid uh, or the 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 cake is put into such unappetizing looking containers right whatever Absolutely. container you food delivery on. containers <laughs> yeah food delivery containers and all and i'm thinking that if you're the company that made this wonderful product why are you not looking at the total system or for example we used to scrub you know it's very undignified to scrub floors on your hands and knees whichever social class you are but the mop that you stand up with and the spin mops the spin mops didn't come from companies that made floor cleaners the right, spin right. mops came from little companies who listed themselves on amazon and hey presto we discovered the spin mop right 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 Right, right now i'm sure there's more you can do with the spin mop but we're hoping now the spin mop who can get on a platform who has wider market access 
uh, at least out of the 10 spin mop companies, one will do something more. I mean, you know, um, um, 3M, for example, says that they sell a mop in China for $40. And I'm saying, really? I don't want a mop for $40, right? So maybe we can do a better mop cheaper. Right, so right. we need the, so I, I think we would like the small sector to have uh, a lot more going for it uh, because it does have a lot more going for it than the large sector. Right, right. Yama, I'm going to come in here because you spoke about Amazon copying, um, or not, I shouldn't use the word, but you talk, talk, spoke about large uh, players copying uh, the ad. And, you know, Piyush Goel was recently talking about predatory prices and the uh, possibility that on these large platforms, the small seller may get squeezed out. Uh, as as you know, as as they pick up, as they sort of copy out their innovations, for instance. Uh, do you have? I mean, and that that's a conversation that's going oh, on. I'm going to say, please read my piece in the Times of India tomorrow. That's what I just wrote before this session, where. Uh... I have said that we need a more nuanced understanding of what is antitrust and competition law and uh, in terms of how it is playing out with our consumers here. And, uh, you know, if you are, I think platforms are the way to go in the future. So I think we have to embrace them and encourage them. Uh, and if you are on a platform, you might actually do better than if you're in a little alleyway somewhere that nobody comes to. And uh, you see the explosion of stuff that you actually get there and you wonder where the hell were all these guys before that we didn't even know they existed, right? We didn't know that many of them existed on, on, on many counts. And a lot of the products we're seeing are actually made in India products. They're not just imported stuff. So, Or if you take any platform, for example, if you take uh, the construction platform, if you take something like Uran, if you take anything else which is comprising the small suppliers, uh, or if you look at the drop shipping uh, uh, businesses and so on and so forth, I think they're doing a lot for small suppliers, which has not been possible before that. But of course, it is the job of a modern economy, uh, for modern and developed society, uh, market economy, to be able to control everybody's bad behavior. And that's what the Competition Commission of India is here for. And whether it's Indian capital or foreign capital, I think everybody has to be controlled the same way. So predatory pricing is bad. Abuse of dominance is bad. Why is it bad? It's bad because it's bad for the consumer and it's bad for the vendors. Now, assuming it's good for the good for the suppliers and good for the vendors and good for the consumers, should we take a more nuanced look at it? Is the question. So I am not supportive of a thousand pound gorilla stopping all over our marketplaces. Absolutely not. But I think better competition would help sort of help that. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Yeah. Coming. So and I'm I going to the first yeah. question is very nice. I'm going to pick up this question from the chat. Actually, I'll begin with that one. Okay. So this is. Uh, totally in Rama's area. Uh, do you think we need a better way to classify Indian consumers? Uh, do, do I think <laughs> we need a better way to classify? I absolutely think so. I think we've had very, very lazy marketing. Also in my book, I've gone to war with uh, income classifications that go aspire, striver. And I'm saying you're pretending to be uh, attitude classification or behavior, whatever class, or behavior classification, I don't know, some kind of a classification, whereas you just stuck a label on it and, you know, different people have stuck different labels on it. So I think we need more customer centricity, most certainly. Do we need better ways to classify people? Yes. In fact, in my book, I'm also talking about culture classes as some ways of doing it, which are people who tap into common cultures that straddle different uh, demographics. But in order to classify better, you need primary data better and nobody's willing to pay for primary data. I mean, so far, I hope that'll change, but so far, as far as companies are concerned, you know, there is the, as I have often written, including in this book, that the belief is that the government of India is a marketing director. So the government of India is meant to create a GDP wind, which is supposed to be a tide. And when the tide goes up, people well, when the tide goes down, you do badly. And so people tell me, oh, Indian economy is not done very well. And I'm saying, why is that making people have less baths? I mean, you know, let's talk about why your stock market is doing badly. Or when was the last time you heard the word market share in any equity analyst report? Uh, so I think we need, we need more specific ways to classify consumers through the lens of a company strategy. I think companies uh, must ask which India is my India? How do I cobble together different little parts of India and make it into a single India? And you have to be willing to put your data where that happens. 
until then i'm saying let's quit all this aspire striver middle class are going to war about what is the middle class and uh, that let's then just look at you know different 20% slabs of the of the income classification and work with them until we know better i really like one of the lines in your book which says that every consumer is an aspiring consumer right Everyone yeah it's to move up it's not yeah. not just one group alone exactly right, right. yes yes yeah okay so let's take another question uh, which says that what are your thoughts on consumers being offered zero interest emis uh, which means it leads to consumption payment pay in small quantities so is this also work how does it work with the lilliput land sorry just repeat that i think it dropped uh, pay, so right now we we are getting micro loans there are so many payment uh, companies which have come uh, taken over the market and they're giving uh small loans and with the uh, short shorter period uh payment uh, period time so is this also one of the consequence of lilliput land because the banks want you to come with guarantee are not giving you these shorter loans so this space seems to have been uh, taken over by the smaller private players also so there are banks then we said uh, the banks you know just to cumbersome let's do nbfcs now we have what the reserve bank calls strategically important ndfcs so we have the big ndfcs now we have the small ndfcs and now we have the fintechs right. and now the fintechs have so far uh, done a bang up good job uh, on on certain counts uh, and i think the data environment is also much more available for them now to be able to uh, you know everybody's pinging the civil database but now there are many more ways of figuring out your credit worthiness and so on and so forth so i think for a certain segment yes i think fintechs are an, again an example of uh, lily putland where they're small and they're agile and they are targeting small consumers so you can have big companies targeting small consumers you can have small companies targeting small consumers and you know the famous uh, even the b2b i say is a big b to a small b so you know sme lending and a lot of sme is what is micro lending honestly is the hottest thing going that a lot of people talk to me about um but also interesting is how rural banking has actually happened right so nobody talks about cost income ratios nobody's moaning and groaning anymore like they used to because you're now able to manage rural banks which what is the problem it's the long tail it's the high scatter and it's the small amounts of money that are there so now with digital processes with uh, other enabled payment systems and with the banking correspondent who's basically an atomized version of the bank so he or she is a mini bank with a mini little phone with a mini pinging device going so we've atomized the bank into little little banking correspondents who are going out and working in their catchment areas and coming back and aggregating back so it's aggregate disaggregate aggregate disaggregate so i think that seems to be working working quite nicely so there's another question which says uh, which uh, where the person is asking will small consumers call the shots going forward and will brands have to mandatorily align with these smaller consumers to drive consumption Uh, let's address mandatory first. Uh, you know there are two things: there's fear and there's greed. Now I've often said that as long as we continue, see post COVID, the rich have got richer. That is true. Uh, that people are surprised surprises me. It's not rocket science that if you have uh, uh, an education and you can work from home and you don't have to go out there and build and build a building in the sun in order to earn your daily wage, you will do extremely well in in bad times. So I think that's. Uh, uh so as long as uh there are enough rich people and the rich or the top 20% i call them t20 are growing richer and deeper and uh, so on a lot of companies are saying um why kiss the frog and wait for the frog to become the prince when i can kiss the prince directly so i don't need these guys so there is no mandatory if you don't need these guys if you're not greedy enough to believe that you will get left out of this whole world you know it's a little bit like if disney says i will not do languages Uh, in Disney Channel, as they used to once upon a time, I used to think that we're the only place in the world producing babies. We produce twenty-one million of them or more every year, right? And we have television for you to have your channel. In another place, you may have Disneyland, but you don't have the television in 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 our neighboring country. And so, if you decide that you are not going to serve them, you will just get left out of the next generation of the world. 
you know now that you want your local managing director to come and justify why you must do in different languages i mean i i keep thinking that you're sitting in america you're the parent you are paid to think about demographic shifts in the world so what is mandatory is a, is a good question uh, right now i think uh, a lot of companies are not feeling the need or the pressure to serve the mass market because uh, the uh, uh, a lot of indian households have actually been under stress for various reasons two years of a slowing economy three years of covid a little bit of inflation but that is where the future is that's where the growth also is so if you say no i don't want them that's fine you may do well enough in what you're doing but uh, at some point in time the day of reckoning will come or you will have a two 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 speed boat where one lot is serviced by one lot and one lot is serviced by one lot so i would say that if you want to participate in india's 5 trillion dollars economy if you want to build for the long term future if you want to build something that on autopilot will grow with the country then i think you should be serving small consumers that's that's uh, that that would be uh, my take and will small consumers call the shots i think to the extent that they are 80% of the country if you they will they will call the shots it's just that their 80% is only worth about 45% of income at the moment uh and you know the remaining 20 are worth much more but uh, absolutely they are in fact we have monster consumers we have consumers who say for very good reason but who say i want more at cheaper prices because we have seen from 1991 the prices of everything coming down and the quality of everything going up right think about how we've trained a generation plus of consumers right i mean from talk time of 16 rupees to the cheapest data from air conditioners that were a luxury after duty and all has gone off now is really much so much cheaper and so on and so forth and then we had so and and you know from days when very few could afford to fly to now if you're willing to put up with indigo and book in advance you actually can no matter who you are and it makes good sense if you're a watchman in a building to not give up four days to travel by train and then these same monster consumers got created as monsters because we had chinese goods who came in and then we had amazon that came in and uh, and then everywhere else in the world high touch went out and then high tech came in in india high touch and high tech came together as a result of which our consumers are saying recognize me in person recognize me on the phone recognize my registered mobile number and who says i can't walk into a bank branch or a shop right i will search here and buy there i will search there and buy here so now every, that's where the omni channel buzz is coming from Like, so our consumers are definitely spoiled i call them monster consumers they will be more demanding and they're learning and now with the new sharing economy they are learning and oyo and this and that they're learning to do a lot more so i think our consumers will call the shots more strongly than uh, consumers anywhere else they don't know the rules as we would like them to so uh, i'm going to uh, i take a question that i have from your book uh, you talk a lot about uh, not lo uh, you talk about uh, d2c companies and how there are plenty of d2c companies in the market but as you mentioned in the book and as we see right now they are hitting uh, uh, they, they are stumbling because it's becoming very very expensive to acquire the next customer because everybody is going after the same set of the top uh, top consumers so uh i mean uh but they have done a lot of innovation in the last few years i feel like uh, some of these d2c companies have changed some of the, it's refreshing what they've done to consumption even my consumption i i feel very thrilled about it but yeah i'm becoming more costly for them to acquire is does this does is the should they also be looking at lilliput land because now everybody is online right now everybody is online but they still seem to be going after one small segment so is and lilliput land available for them maybe much more cheaper 
uh, I think they are Lilliput land, Akshar. They are they are the suppliers of Lilliput land. I mean, I always say you throw a stone and crowd it in there, you'll hit two fifty crores. Mm-hmm. You, what happens after that? I mean, not this. Right, right. So they are getting fifty so hundred so, easily. So they're no longer the you know if you did two fifty crores to a big company, they would say yeah, that's nice, that's good, but they would squeeze it and say how do I build a billion dollar brand? How do I build this? How do I build that? So the fact that uh, many of them are quite happy with small turnovers and small catchment areas uh, tells you that that is to me part of the Lilliput phenomenon that they are doing the small consumers and small brands but you're right that many of them are feeling unhappy because beyond the point uh, the VC wants you to grow and you don't know how to grow and I think fundamentally if you have forgotten what branding really means which is who am I why by me and uh, what is the value that I'm delivering to you, which is advantageous over the next guy? So some of them have. I mean, you know, I love, for example, what Mama Earth has done. I love what a lot of detail, but some of the, the potato chip brands I'm not so gonna know about. But uh, some of the, uh, some of the, well, these guys will be competing. So some of these guys will also be competing with, uh, let's say, and uh, and and um, a brands that are sourcing. Uh, clothing from China. Okay, if you take someone like Numi or something, they're sourcing clothing from China. It's under the nose, under the nose, under the nose of Zara, and even below that, and below that, and below that. Mm-hmm. But I think what is happening to a lot of these companies, you're right, is that it is getting expensive to acquire customers. The idea that it was very that digital is cheap, I think we're all learning it is not. I uh, right. continuously uh, get asked uh, by board colleagues from the finance stream that you know is it reasonable that this much money is being spent on digital advertising i mean who's making money out here and i think the answers are a little bit uncomfortable uh, to be able to respond to so now they've started the new buzz um and that is to say that oh we have to go on the channel you know digital is not good enough everybody's got to go on the channel basically it means that the more physical stores you set up every time you set up a new physical store you will show some revenue growth Right. So if you do 500 stores, then, you know, your VC will be a little more happy because you've shown that much more growth. Right. But So I think that is what is driving them into the physical the space. Correct. But what they're saying is that, oh, you can't build brands digitally, which you and I know is a lot of hogwash because there are right. enough digital brands that have been built digitally. Right. So, you know, sometimes you tell ourselves stories and that's the way it works. So I would say that the D2C brands now have to get off the realize that D2C is not the strategy. It's a part of the strategy and that you still have to build a brand. Yeah. And how do you build that brand and how do you grow the brand and, you know, build it digitally if that is your tikana? Because if you're building it through physical stores, it doesn't mean it's becoming a brand. Absolutely. It just means you're going to have a more unwieldy creature somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> with scatters of, of, of distribution and then they'll go through mainstream distribution and then you know how are you anyway we sell through Amazon I'm not very sure how you'll be to see but it's okay we'll, we'll not question that thank you I, I had to ask about D2C uh, yes. but there are a lot of questions that are coming in uh, so let me just pick up one question randomly uh, yeah so this is from uh, Kopal Agar- Agrawal she's asking uh, Kopal is asking, is rural marketing strategy, does it still exist or is it all urban and what is the change in rural consumption behavior? Uh, Hi, Kopal. I have uh, shown in my book that the rural-urban divide is blurring and blurring quite uh, significantly. Um, We also see that from the census, uh, last census, I wish we would get a new one very soon, which showed that a lot of the urban growth, actually what is called urbanization, was coming through census towns. Census towns are neither fish nor fowl. It's also the way we define, in fact, I've discussed in my book that rural for us is a definitional issue. Mm-hmm. You know, it is, uh, there is uh, there are certain criteria that you have to have in order to be urban. And there are certain criteria that you have to have one minus that, which determines what is rural and what is urban. And a lot of companies now talk about semi-urban, peri-urban, urban, which basically means that a lot of our census towns are overgrown villages because 75% of the male workforce is not engaged in agriculture. But on right. the other hand, they don't have municipal bodies that govern them, right? Mm-hmm. And they don't have panchayats either. So, I mean, or, uh, or, so they're kind of not fulfilling the criteria of rural and they're not fulfilling the criteria of urban. 
And that's where a lot of organizations come in. Also, the blurring is happening because I think they're watching the same things. They have access to the same information. I've also shown in my book that half of the top 20% of India is actually in rural India. There is a pocket of rural that uh, uh, my research calls um, uh, developed rural, which actually has is significantly large and has more money than a tier two town. So the urban rural is blurring. Uh, it is true that half of rich India lives in rural, but it's also true that most of poor India lives in rural. After COVID, uh, the data is showing that uh, there is a lot more urban poverty. So it's not 80% of the poor don't live in rural, about 70%, do and 10%, you know, 30% are living in urban. So, and also now, if you look at all the e-commerce, people tell you how many PIN codes they distribute to, and the PIN codes seem to be, I mean, I keep telling them a PIN code is not a consumer piece, but even so, the PIN code seems to be significantly rural. So I would say that it's time to uh, find new classifications rather than the old rural and urban. Rural marketing, I mean, is, is urban marketing, is small town marketing, is poor people marketing, whatever. Okay. Uh, so, Rama, you, there's one question uh, from an attendee. Yeah. So, we have lessons for the big businesses, but this attendee is asking what about lessons for other countries of the world, Europe, US, and all that? Lessons for them? Or from, from India, them. which they can, which you can tell them. You know, we can fix ourselves. I don't really care what we do to the others, but uh, it has been argued a lot, and I think uh, uh, there is, uh, and, and in fact, Vijay Govindrajan, a lot of his work is around what he calls reverse innovation. Uh, so I think how to do things frugally, how to get superior performance. Uh, in my book, I've also talked about a lot of the writing that has gone around how ISRO has uh, managed to put uh, uh, the the moon mission uh, or is the Mars mission at, uh, even the moon mission at prices that are at cost that are less than Hollywood movies. So I think the whole business of how to how to strip waste and how to get uh, better performance at lower prices is something we've learned and we've learned quite well. You will see it even when a multinational company wants to do a conference. I mean, by the time they've flown in tons of equipment, tons of people and everything, I'm thinking, oh God, can't we do it cheaper? It is also true, by the way, that as an urbanite, when I go to my rural home in rural Tamil Nadu, I find that some of the solutions they're giving me when I'm saying, oh, throw this away, it's not working. And they say, oh, if you just put a coin underneath the battery, madam, your torch will work. I'm actually feeling quite foolish. Or I'm like, oh my God, how am I ever going to do this call? Because uh, I, the, 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 it's raining and, and how am I going to manage? And then I jump through hoops thinking I have to drive to the nearest town and uh, what is the where am I going to do the call? And then my cab driver will say, I will just come and park at your main gate to sit in the cab and do the call. And I'm thinking, why didn't I think about it earlier? So I think we're also getting that same way the way. But yes, we do have lessons for the world. I'm told that UPI is now going to go around the world, right. which is absolutely phenomenal. But, you know, if we can just fix ourselves, I think the world will fix itself. <laughs> great, great. Uh, so, so there's one more question, no? uh, which is, well, this was this question was asking about you know what can the world learn from us, and then there was a sectoral question, which is asking about uh, Jyoti is asking about uh, pharma companies and how they can play a role in the liquid land to ensure medical access to all. Um, yeah, I just saw something pop up saying where can we buy the book? You can buy it on Amazon, or you can buy it at your nearest retailer. <laughs> Because one thing I do, you can buy it the next time you're going to an airport because every time I travel through an airport, that's the only thing I do nowadays before getting my coffee. Uh, but yes, I, I think that uh, pharma is, is a fantastic example of how we are the drug factory to the world. Uh, I think wherever we are doing, uh, because we are able to, to get it done and we are price controlled, of course. So as far as Lilliput land is concerned, I think uh, we have access to essential medicines because of price control more than anywhere else. But uh, whether now, I think the challenge according to me is that can you move from being a supplier to buyers around the world to building dominant market positions? And I am quite happy to note that there are, well, not even a handful, actually a very small number, and I have to be careful what I say, 
uh, but there is a very small, uh, a very, very, very small number uh, that actually is uh, taking uh, newer drugs, which are specialty drugs, and actually putting them into markets overseas. And as an Indian, that makes me feel absolutely amazing. Yeah. But also, one of the examples, for example, that's often been talked about uh, is an experiment that got run. It's called the polypill, and you can Google it. And that polypill is an interesting example of uh, innovation for Lilliput land, where they're saying that people who have one problem, like a heart problem, usually have two, three other problems as well. And that if you have, instead of having a separate pill for each of them, which also has compliance and cost, if you have one pill that can work for all the, the for, for all the indications or for many of these indications, it may not work perfectly for each one, but on an average, it makes the patient's well-being better then you're much better off. And this innovation actually went quite far. And then I don't remember what happened after that. It's, uh, it was a group that comprised some Indians, some Australians, it's called the Polypill, to Google that, yeah. So uh, I, I made a note in the beginning, you were talking about uh, the exam, uh, companies which have really crashed the cost while also maintaining quality. Can you give one example, one or two examples uh, so that uh, my three ends, my, my three ends of India are Nirma Nano and Nokia. Mm. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Before Nokia came, we were all resigned to the fact as consumers that uh, if you want uh, something cheap, then you cannot have the best design under, under the world. But if you looked at the design of uh, uh, of what Nokia showed us at that point in time. Uh, I remember doing some work at that time for a two-wheeler company and even people who were buying the lower end of two-wheelers just wanted better design because what they learn in one category, they transfer to another category. Okay, um, I spent uh, a lot of time as an, as an insider, outsider, outside consultant around uh, Hindustan Viva at that time, uh, looking at uh, uh, studying Nirma a little bit and had a ringside view of how that company actually adapted and built a whole new popular business model uh, in order to be able to do that and how now they're absolutely the champions of doing that. Now, again, uh, yes, there were issues with the Nano, but I think it was a feat of being able to deliver a certain level of price performance. So just because things haven't gone uh, the right way in the market for various reasons for that company doesn't mean that we as marketers or business people don't take lessons away. So for example, I loved the Subiksha business model. I mean, to me, it was just exactly what the daughter, uh, doctor ordered of having small stores, nicely branded, not very expensive. That went bust for a completely different set of reasons. Uh, does not take away from the validity of that uh, of that model. You know, I love prepaid. Uh, I love uh, Uber. I absolutely love all your rooms. Now, just because they have fallen prey, let's assume, to taking loans, um, moving faster than they should have, not having the patience to scale, whatever may be their pressures, doesn't mean that the model of uh, price performance profit isn't right. Right. And I think that for me is the huge big change that at last we found the holy grail. Right, Thanks right. to digital. Right. No, I, I guess COVID that way has been a blessing for consumption <laughs> and these probably smaller players because there's been a lot of change. Yes. In uh, this thing. I can't like I don't imagine I can't imagine going to the beauty parlor anymore. You get urban club coming, urban couple. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Right. Exactly. And I once had many years ago the chairman of I forget it must be L'Oreal, and he said that luxury for you guys, for example, you can get someone to come home and give you a massage uh, at very short notice in the luxury of your own home, and uh, he said that is luxury, but it's really not luxury the way you would imagine luxury elsewhere. That is true. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 Uh... So uh, let me see if there are any more questions from here. A uh, lot of thanks uh, to you for explaining things in very simple, complex things in very simple manner. Uh, so somebody wants to know a little bit about uh, what this means for for-profit social enterprises. And yeah. For-profit, what is a not-for-profit social enterprises? They have written for profit social enterprises, probably mean non profitable. 
profitable social enterprise but social enterprise social enterprise yeah. social enterprise is the key social but for profit yeah but yeah yeah so should we stick to the okay so that's the mohammed yunus def definition of no dividend uh, return of capital right but profit you may or not for profit enterprises that must make profit but must plow it back into the company 85% okay let's work for that i uh, i i think the the minute you are for profit i think all the benefits all the you know not for profit doesn't mean you don't make a profit right you want to maximize your profit and spend 85% of it coming back into the business and when i mean maximize profit what i'm really saying is that you will target typically social enterprises are again targeting uh, modest income consumers people who have uh, who who are not often integrated with the mainstream so for example if you look at education if you look at health and if you look at a lot of those and i think it's exactly the same thing you've got to aggregate buyers aggregate suppliers which is what they do right when you take a mobile van of diagnostics to the villages what are you doing you're aggregating buyers you mean you know you're you're having linkages where you're aggregating doctors at the other end that you can look at you're digitalizing to crash costs and you're enabling sharing so i think the 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 core is uh, pretty much the same as we say and i am a c c c f conceptual clarity and context familiarity so i think the conceptual clarity travels much more the context will take care of itself so uh, rama i'm we have five four more minutes left and i'm going to probably end it with a question which is probably more uh, relevant to us uh, in the education sector so one of the things that you mentioned just now is uh, Uh, oyo uh, the business model or whatever their business may be problematic but this is the kind of service that we need and i guess something like that is probably happening in the education sector the business model needs to be figured out be it by juice or be it like coursera yeah right and when they do figure it out it is going to probably disrupt education and our lives in uh, in uh, significant ways right so uh, because there is so much potential we have like 2 and 1/2 lakh people giving cat 22 lakh people giving need and how many and we don't have the institutions right now to serve all these students and all not just and these are just a small group people want to upgrade their skills at different points of time so probably do you see some such uh, disruption coming here because i see a lot lilliput land applied completely over here and not these consumers not being served at all uh yeah i think it's a good question but i think it's also a question of strategic intent right so the the fact that a market is there does that make it my market and right. i suspect the answers would be very different uh, if you asked uh, even different people on your board of governors assuming they had a say in the matter or if you asked different faculty members if you put it to a faculty council i think there are some who would say yes we got to serve the mass market and some who say no so right. i i think you're absolutely right that there are a lot of spaces if you just take management education i think even serving the small businesses we used to do a small business program and do it very well and so on and so forth but i don't know if we do it anymore etc etc so i think uh, we've all sort of i think the pedagogy is important uh, because i also find that everybody who's been in online forget by juice but who've been doing online classes are now wanting to do it offline right. um, so you know clearly this is the same this is the the first cousin of oh we can't build brands digitally I think you have to learn to do things differently. I mean, for a start, you have to invest in technology, even in our classrooms. Mm-hmm. I mean, I saw that overseas, everybody has this huge circular wall, which is like sitting in an auditorium, and you can actually see everybody at the same time. Whereas we are struggling. If you have a large enough class, you have three screens. You don't know who's doing what. You know, you're confused. They're confused, uh, and most people have tuned out. So, so we've also right. got to get our act together in terms of how do you engage people better. What is the pedagogy for the new world? And I think sure. that uh, so so there's that, and then there's the choice of target market. I mean, I think the class or mass debate is an unending debate, and it's now translating into online offline, which it should not do. I think it can't be class equal to offline, mass equal to online. Right, right. So right. I think it has to be yeah. some combination of everything. So I mean, if we can actually pick the best and the brightest who can't come to a PGP X program, but can work evening classes and get an equally blue-blooded degree, why not? Right, right. 
Yeah. Hopefully, I eat uh, that IEPG pro people. We are doing that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <are> doing that. <laughs> Solve that problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's that's we are at five fifteen and six o'clock. Uh, so. Uh, if there are any more questions, I'll wait for a minute uh, from the participants. Uh, any any last words that you would like to add, Rama, before while we wait for any more questions? No, no. Other than saying thank you very much, I think this has been a really fun discussion. I hope it was fun for the participants as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah, we had most of the participants stay till the end of the chat, so that means yes. that's that's a good sign, right? <laughs> Yes. Right. In the <laughs> cyber world, you cannot lock them up, right? The only last thing I want to say is that if anybody has a question, is Indian consumers ready for digital and e-commerce? I want to tell you that the day our temples went digital, everything else is digital. Okay? <laughs> and if we are willing to accept, uh, we are, I had to do an OTP to get into the mandir nearby during COVID, okay? Um, and so did everybody else. So once we have figured all that out with temples, I mean, you know, of course we're ready. We are completely ready. <laughs> There were some. Uh, there are some questions about favorite books uh, recommended by Rama. Uh, related favorite Manage books. I think that we can end with that. Management yeah. books. Management books. Uh, yeah, I have to tell you a lot about fiction, but I suspect you ask about management books. I think absolutely, uh, my guru god is C.K. Pralat. So, competing for the future, fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, uh, are, are absolutely uh, essential reading as far as I'm concerned. My other most favorite book is The Mind of the Strategist by Kenichi Omai, who is my other guru god in terms of, he says the heart of strategy is not about adding, it's not about beating the competitor, but about uh, adding value to the customer and avoiding the competitive battle altogether. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's another one. And um, yeah, I read Lots of stuff uh, here and there. I can't, can't immediately recall. But just uh, my advice to you is just pick, get your hands on whatever you can read. But let it engage with your brain and take away whatever you want to take away. You're not obliged to mug up the whole book. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes. I think so Poor Economics come... by Abhijit Banerjee. Poor Economics by Abhijit Banerjee. I love that too. Yeah. Sorry. So there are other questions coming in, but I think I've sent the I've sent out your uh, web page link also, and I'm sure people can email you if they have further questions. Uh, right. So uh, thank you so much, Rama, and thank you so much, Akshaya, for moderating this. No, no, it's always a pleasure it's chatting a with Rama. Yes. So yes, yes, yes. It's yeah, it's thanks so a privilege, actually. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys, and thanks, Varuna, though you are not visible on screen for putting. Yeah, thank you, Varuna, for uh, getting us together. She did. Please do thank me. It's what I do. It's what I do. It's what I do, it's what I do, ma'am. You don't have to thank me for this. It's what I do. <laughs> and thank you, participants. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. For your thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 -bye.